So hello to all. My name is Mirtani Pieri. I am a molecular biologist and an assistant professor at the University of Nicosia here in Cyprus. And today I'm thrilled to have the privilege of facilitating this virtual discussion hosted by the British High Commission with Professor Carol Mandel. Carol Mandel is a professor of extragalactic astronomy and head of astrophysics at the University of Bath in the UK. She's also a fellow of the Institute of Physi Physics. So Professor Mandel, it's a true pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. Um, and I would like to begin our talk um, with your appointment as the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which I understand that from 2020 was merged with the Department of International Development, and now it's the new Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, correct? That's correct, yes. It's a very exciting change. Um, and I think now we have uh, a real opportunity uh, to work internationally to combine our development work with our foreign policy work and, in fact, um, really amplify um, our role as a force for good in the world. And my role really is to put the best possible scientific evidence at the heart of that to advise our policy teams and our ministers and also to use that science expertise and our international collaborations to build friendships and relationships around the world so that science really sits at the heart um, of our, our modern prosperity, security, um, and ultimately, you know, to make the world a safer place. As your role of Chief Scientific Advisor, um, that, that includes uh, COVAX, right? And, and can, can you tell us a little bit more of what COVAX is? Uh, what is the science of the initiative? Yeah, so this initiative um, is really important at the moment. Obviously, the world is in a, a very difficult situation at the moment. We have a global pandemic. The coronavirus is impacting communities and societies around the world. There's no country, really, that's been untouched by this, this crisis. Um, and of course, you know, the UK is known at the moment for having one of the leading vaccine candidates in trial. Um, so that's really exciting and that's a real testament to the excellence of our, our science ecosystem and our, our wonderful scientists who've been working for many years. I mean, vaccines don't just pop up when you have a pandemic. I mean, this is, you know, decades worth of work. Professor Sarah Gilbert um, is a scientist at the University of Oxford who's leading that work. So, you know, we're really excited about the, 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 science, the science that she, she's doing there. Um, there are a number of vaccine candidates around the world. And of course, we know that developing a vaccine for a coronavirus is incredibly challenging. And so, you know, there's no guarantee that that particular vaccine or indeed any of the vaccines will be successful. And what we realized very quickly was that this was not um, something that we could keep to ourselves if we were successful, that in fact, we help ourselves by helping others. It is a global pandemic. We have to solve this at a global scale. Um, COVAX is a mechanism by which um, many, many countries, in fact, all countries can get equitable access to vaccines. But of course, not all countries can afford to buy vaccines vaccines. And so we realised that in fact we were hosting the Gavi conference in June, so the Prime Minister, Mr Boris Johnson, um, hosted world leaders to talk about how we would make sure that when we have a vaccine or vaccines, um, we can give particularly the, the poorest countries access to those vaccines. And so we asked countries to come to the table and to pledge an ambitious amount of money to make sure that there was a funding pot to help countries who were not able to buy vaccines and didn't have their own vaccine candidate to be able to, to, to reach into that pot. Um, and so there was a, a really positive um, response to that. World leaders came and they pledged. I mean, I, I actually have lost track of where that pot is now. Our target was 7.4 billion. Um, by the end of that week, I think we'd already raised pledges for 8. 4 billion and I think it's still going up. Now that's quite a lot of money and of course what we really need is an efficient way, an efficient mechanism um, to help those vaccines um, be, be, be accessed. And so COVAX is really the practical mechanism um, for countries to do that. Now the you know, high income countries are able to, to, to purchase vaccines themselves um, and actually can, can reach into that, uh, that ecosystem if you like of vaccine supply. But middle income countries and low income countries um, needed to, to have a, a practical mechanism to do that. So what the UK did was we said, well, we would put a significant amount of money, many hundreds of millions, into that COVAX facility. Um, we helped to, to make that more efficient. And then we said we'll also put extra money on the table. So other countries who can afford vaccines, if they come to the table and match our funding, that will actually leverage even more support for the low and middle income countries. And so that COVAX facility now is there that once we have a suite of global vaccines, that's the mechanism by which countries will be able to 
to access those vaccines in a practical way. So this is brilliant. So nobody wins until we all win. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are a globally connected world. We saw how quickly this virus transmitted around the world because people travel, people want to travel for, for business, um, for, for vacation. And in fact, we are a very globally collect connected world. And we saw when the virus started to hit in the first wave that countries started to close their borders. People started to, to stay home. People were in lockdown. In fact, you know, many countries are now going into a second wave if they had a lockdown. Those countries that, that didn't have a lockdown lockdown is still sustaining their infection rates and in fact increasing them. And so we know that the virus is spread by people. We are all virus factories once we catch this virus. And of course, people movement um, is what actually helps that spread. And so we want to get back to a mobile, globally connected world. We want to get back to the normal lives that we had. We want to be able to go out, see our friends and family, socialize, work in the way we did in the past. And we can't do that until the world is safe. And so really this vaccine solution is the thing that will help us to to go back to to a, a normal way of living and it's very interesting as you said that um uh, covid19 is a, is a global issue and we keep it seems like we try to um to solve it with local um local measures whereas as you say it, it we have to open up and and include everyone so I want I want to I want to say I want to touch on what you said that um, scientists are these are unprecedented times and scientists are asked to develop a vaccine in, in no time really and therapies in no time, but at the same time we see how um, we witness uh, these unbelievable amounts of misinformation and and, and fake data around uh, the, the virus the vaccines the cons conspiracy theories sometimes the spread with the same. Uh, uh, or, or even higher speeds than the virus itself. Yes. How do you think we can tackle this misinformation wave? So I, I think really the fundamental here is is understanding. And so when I, I, particularly when I'm working with our scientists, understanding is really important so that we can explain to people um, what the, the real science is underlying this. That's the first step. The second one is to make sure that nations are sharing robust data transparently. And this was something very early on in the pandemic, the Chinese authorities shared worldwide the genetic sequence of the virus. And that was really important that that was shared openly with the world. And it meant that all of the countries who had the scientific capability could then start to work on developing tests, developing um, screening programs, developing adapted therapies and also starting to adapt vaccine technologies to this particular virus. So that openness and transparency is really important. And then the international collaboration between our scientific groups is also really important. So our UK researchers don't just work in UK based teams. And again, it goes back to why we have to collaborate across borders, because those people to people relationships are really what builds trust. And so you start to build up that international network, the collaborations are then important important and also the scientific systems that you have in your country and so in the UK we have you know, very well developed um, ethics frameworks and ethics procedures um, so for example random controlled trials really are the scientific gold standard of medical um, research really and one of the, the I think the outstanding example for me was the early random controlled trials that were put in place at the beginning of the pandemic so we have um, a mechanism in government called the science advisory group in emergencies sage this is um, a group of experts relevant for a crisis that sir patrick valance the government chief scientific advisor will scramble um, in order to advise him so he can actually give good evidence-based advice to the prime minister particularly when the um, the issue is a complex emergency. And so SAGE was set up for COVID very early on in January and the teams relevant for the clinical trials put those in place and we very quickly recruited a large number of patients obviously who were becoming ill, who were being admitted to hospital. And it was fantastic that collaboration between the patients, their families and the scientists allowed us to do those random controlled trials, particularly for drugs that already exist. So the one that stands out for me is dexamethasone. This is an anti-inflammatory drug. It's been 
been around for maybe 40 years, very easily accessible in all countries, but it's quite a complex drug. So for some conditions, it works well. For some conditions, it doesn't really do anything. And for other conditions, it can actually be dangerous. So in fact, although one might guess that it might be useful for this new virus, there was no clinical evidence that proved either its efficacy or its safety. And what happened in the recovery trial, um, which was led from the UK, was that patients were given this as um, a part of their treatment when they were critically ill in hospital. And we also had a sample of patients who were agreed um, to be part of this trial who were also given a placebo. And these are blind trials. So the doctors, the patients, nobody knows who's been given which drug. And there's no difficult decisions as to who gets what. It's all completely um, blind and, and randomized. And at the end, analyzing those data, it was very clear that dexamethasone, first of all, is very um, powerful and effective at mitigating severe illness in COVID. But what it also told the doctors was which patients should, should have this to benefit and at what point of the di di disease progression. And we were able to prove that scientifically and mathematically, if you like, statistically significantly. So all of a sudden we move away, particularly even from experts saying, does this work or doesn't this work? We move the frontiers of knowledge on and then we can communicate that very clearly and the research is published in a, a reputable peer-reviewed paper. So that's something, that's, that simple example shows how we can really tackle misinformation, which sometimes comes from misunderstanding and confusion, um, and also disinformation, which is really the egregious effort to try to muddy the waters and confuse people. We could tell a, a consistent, simple story. It was backed up by good scientific evidence that everybody could look and say, yeah, I understand how that works. Our clinicians are then around the world equipped to know exactly how to use those drugs, and then they see the results for themselves. And so it's that evidence base all the way through from the design of the study, the communication of it, and then how it impacts patients' lives. Also, the UK has an initiative on genomics, on viral samples. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about that? Because that's very interesting and um, we move towards the personalised uh, treatments, right? Yeah, this is a really exciting initiative. So this was actually led by Professor Sharon Peacock at the University of Cambridge. She also works in government in the public health um, agency. And she is um, a world leading genomic, genomic scientist and an e expert on infectious diseases. And what she did very early on, again, as part of our SAGE mechanism, right at the beginning of um, the, the, the virus in January, she realized that what was really important was to set up a genetic surveillance system. So this is is different to the um, sort of point of care testing to see if you have an infection. This is a research study. And she brought together 16 of our world leading um, genetic research groups from around universities around the UK. So all of these groups had different kinds of expertise, different science focus, but coming together really to orientate and, and focus particularly on COVID. And so when those genetic samples started to come in from patients, they started to analyze them and they were looking at the, um, the genetic material or the genetic um, line of the of the virus and there are a couple of things they were keen to do first of all to monitor for genetic um, alterations naturally um, as the infection spread this is important for vaccine development because obviously if the virus mutates we want to understand that as early as possible but the other thing that that did was because these these samples and um, the, the experiments they do are very sensitive so they can see tiny changes in the genetic material and what they were able to do was very cleverly detect the movement of the virus if you like it in the population and what they did was they were able to really pin down the nature of the UK epidemic itself we were modeling epidem the, the epidemic in terms of epidemiological models and we were adding some statistics and we were looking at how the, the numbers of infections rose but that was really a, a forward model if you like with some underlying assumptions and what her team were able to show was that in just a, a short window of about three days the infection was seeded widely across the UK, just in that tiny short time window. And that was why it took off so voraciously. She also showed that about 75% of those infections came from our European, um, European neighbours. So from France, from Italy and from Spain, travelling be between those, th those countries. And so we were able to really understand the nature of our own virus in great detail. What she was also able to do was track it right down um, to, to individuals. So an outbreak 
for example, in a care home to actually really see where these different genetic trees were leading us. And the final thing that I think was really interesting about the study was it showed that lockdown really worked. So obviously we had all our travel data, we could see the infection rates dropping, we could see hospital admissions dropping, but what she proved with the genetic lines, and these are anonymized patient data, so we're not tracking individuals, but um, what she could see was that actual genetic branches became extinct with lockdown. So it showed that the disease transmission was being broken by people really adhering to government guidelines, doing exactly as the science told them, and they stayed home and broke those person to person uh, chains of contact. And so the, the really important thing about the COG UK study was that all of these genetic samples and all of the analysis are publicly available. They're in, I think, one of the world's largest genetic databases for this virus. They're publicly available for scientists to access around the world. And what's really exciting about that is it shows how if we can have other countries doing a similar thing and other countries now are doing that, we can connect all of that information together and really track the spread of the virus and any genetic mutations that have happened in the past and may happen in the future. This is very interesting indeed. Um, I would like to ask one more thing concerning the vaccines. So it seems that um, the, the vaccines is not a sprint, it's a marathon really. And um, obviously one of these vaccines will come out as, as first. But my question is a little bit more ethical and I would like your point of view. Once this one first vaccine comes out, how after that, do we just give it to everyone? And will people still enroll in clinical trials when we already have a vaccine out? Yeah, let, let me answer your question in reverse. So the clinical trials are incredibly important. And again, we have um, very strict rules in the UK, very strict research rules about how you run these kinds of clinical trials. The first stage is obviously to show that the vaccine is safe. And so our, our Oxford vaccine has gone on through that stage. The next stage then, of course, is to show that it's efficacious and not just that it's efficacious, but in, in what way and to, to what level and particularly in what kinds of patients. And so recently, um, the study has moved into understanding how the vaccine behaves in, in older patients. Often when we become older, our immune system becomes less reactive. And so we may hold immunity for a shorter period of time or we may react less strongly to a vaccine and be less protected. So what's really important about the clinical trials is that we understand um, how the vaccine plays in people and also, um, you know, how the vaccines work in terms of protecting different kinds of um, people within our population. So as I say, age is one of those factors. And so we do have um, a suite of vaccines around the world that are at different stages of those trials. Um, as you say, we have a couple of front runners, which we hope will, uh, will come through fairly soon. Um, but I think what's also really important to understand is that the suite of different vaccines and it's an unprecedented time for vaccine development very rapid development but these different vaccines actually have developed different kinds of technologies some of the vaccines will um, prevent people we hope from becoming severely ill but they may not prevent people from passing on the virus um, others will elicit immune response and we really hope will help people to become immune um, and then will not spread the disease so we need to really understand the details of each vaccine um, and also we need to understand um, whether you need to have a booster jab so some vaccines for some illnesses um, you need to have a regular um, booster so for example flu um, people who are you know in the risk category for, for serious illness from, from influenza will go and get their flu jab every year. Um, they won't say have a, a jab for five or ten years, it's every year. So it's really understanding the nature of the immunity that the virus um, is it, we're protected from with the vaccine and the real nature of how clinically we need to provide that vaccine. And then I guess the final piece is also how we store and transport those vaccines. Some of the vaccines at the moment, because they're very new technology, have to be stored at very cold temperatures. So minus 80 degrees Celsius is, a, is an example that's incredibly cold and they have to be kept cold throughout their lifetime from production through to delivery to the patient, it's the so-called cold chain. Um, the Oxford vaccine, I understand, is, is not a cold chain vaccine, which is very positive. Um, but obviously, if those some of those cold chain vaccines are ultimately down the, the line, start to become deployable um, in a clinical sense, we also need to make sure that we have the technology to keep those vaccines good and not have them spoil um, from the production right through to the delivery to the patients. And so there's lots of challenges, not just in the lab, not just in the clinical trials, but right through to our logistics worldwide, in 
fact that we need to come together as nations to make sure that we can deliver the full chain of the vaccine right to our patients. It's important to also state that um, pausing these trials, the vaccine trials, is something quite common because people were very worried when the first pause was communicated by the media. Uh, but this is something that, that happens, right? And they then they they resume again. Yeah, I mean, this is absolutely standard practice in all vaccine trials, and it's a really important part of the vaccine trial design. And in the same way as the, the clinical trials, the random control trials for repurposed therapeutics, for vaccines also, these are also blind trials. So when patients come along to have um, to take their, their test vaccine, they don't actually know whether they're being given a vaccine for, for the virus or whether they're given a placebo. In some of these trials, they're given a meningitis vaccine, which of course course is a very safe long-standing vaccine protects you from meningitis um, but in the actual trials we don't know which patient's been given what so if a patient does have an adverse reaction the trials are immediately stopped and there are a very robust group of um, experts who come together um, on the ethics board and the clinical trials boards who then review the patient data they have to pull that patient data out they have to then if you like open up the anonymity and say what are the particular characteristics did this patient receive uh, the new vaccine that's being trialed or did they receive something else do they have a different condition that's not related to the vaccine that's being tested and so the, the doctors and the scientists don't know that um, ahead of time uh, so as not to bias the trial and it's really those ethics boards again with all the right privacy in place that will then look at those data and say no actually this is not the vaccine that's being tested that's caused this adverse reaction or we understand uh, what's happened in this case they sign off on all the safety data and then they decide whether the clinical trial should continue and in these cases the, the clinical trials have been restarted brilliant so this shows all the safety uh, issues are there in place and they work properly absolutely yeah so, Professor Mandel, moving away from COVID now and into a different subject, um, this year, 2020, the Nobel Prize in Physics was given to Andrea Ghez um, for the discovery of, uh, well, shared Nobel, for the discovery of a supermassive compact object in the center of our galaxy. Now, from the, I, I have written here from the 2015 individuals that have received the Nobel Prize in Physics, only four are women. Um, so how easy or not is it, you, you're a woman in astrophysics in a mostly male dominant environment, how is it for a woman to work and thrive in a field which is male dominated? Yes, it's a really good question and I, I was really excited uh, to see the Nobel Prize this year, not only for the recipients but actually for the topic which is very close to my heart, this is my research area, so it's fantastic to see that that recognised. Um, and I think, you know, to, to now know that we have two uh, women in the whole world living who have a Nobel Prize in physics really shows where we have to to do some work in our, our research field. Andrea, of course, was the first woman in astrophysics ever to receive a Nobel Prize. Um, and actually it was a couple of years ago where Professor Donna Strickland um, won the Nobel in physics um, for her work on, on photonics and, and laser physics. And so it's, it's, I think it's really important that we have role models. If you can't see someone who is like you, you can't necessarily imagine being that, that person. Role models are incredibly important. And physics, of course, often is portrayed as a very white male dominated field and of course I, I think that's, um, that's historic and we have real active work that we have to do to move the dial on that I think we're doing better astrophysics has actually really helped I mean we do see more diversity in astrophysics it's it sort of triggers the interest in young children boys and girls and it's one of those subjects one of those big subjects where children will want to study it they want to come to university and then we we do maths and physics by default because that's really what astrophysics is maths and physics applied to the universe and whether they go on to be physicists, to be astrophysicists, to go out into all sorts of other careers, um, that's also really exciting. So we kind of have to add up where all of our, our physics students are, are hidden out in other professions, a very, very diverse range of professions that they go on uh, to, to take up. But I think internationally, you know, we have to learn from other countries as well. And we have to look at countries that have good practice. We have to do a number of things. We need the role models. We need to support um, boys and girls in school and let them know that anybody 
anybody can do physics because physics is is neutral it's not gendered um, there isn't a race bias in physics itself these are equations this is the nature of the universe it's the nature of the world we all live in that we're trying to understand and so we have to tackle biases that might come in very early on we have to help parents understand that if their children are interested in this subject they can go ahead and study it and be successful in it whatever their background is whatever their gender um, is and then we have to provide the right support mechanisms throughout the pipeline and we also have to tackle some of the more toxic behaviors that I have seen in my profession to be honest um, whether that's a, a kind of a machismo or an arrogance or sometimes even more serious cases for example of sexual harassment and there have been you know some very public cases internationally that have hit the press over the last few years and we really are starting to have those conversations publicly about how we have to move the dial we have to support our young scientists and we have to make our field inclusive and positive so that people can come through and do their very very best work and then ultimately if they win a Nobel Prize that's hugely thrilling but there are so so many brilliant scientists in the world who will not go on to win a Nobel Prize because there are very few people in the world who win them and science is done in teams and I think we have to recognize the work that teams do and diverse teams do the best science. How in, in Cyprus, Professor Mandel, in the last decade, there are a number of institutions that try to, to promote gender equality in general. And there's a big debate concerning uh, introduction of quota, quota system to favor the participation of women in decision-making bodies. And you see it in various decision-making bodies. So uh, people argue, some people argue that um, these measures are discriminating uh, against the best candidates, irrespective of gender, whereas other people uh, argue that uh, you know a woman's quota is about correcting discrimination. What is your what is your opinion on that? Well, I, I could be provocative and say that you know, with all respect to our, our, our white male colleagues, they've probably had positive discrimination for for hundreds of years. Um, I think it's a really important thing to to communicate well. So even if, I mean, let's take physics as an example, even if we positively discriminated or, uh, to, you know, towards all of the women who are currently in physics, we wouldn't get to 50-50, right? So we clearly have biases in our system. We have to flush those biases out. One way to do that, and there are countries, I think in Scandinavia, who've done this for, for board membership, for example, is just to agree 50-50. You have 50% and you fill those, those positions with the best people. There'll be controversy the first time you, you introduce that system and after one cycle, Cycle, it will be normalized. Currently, if we look at the gender pay gap internationally, it project, projections are that it'll be something like 170 years before we close the gender pay gap naturally at the pace we're going at the moment. So it's clear that there needs to be some corrective efforts taken and those can be done in a very effective way. The, what we mustn't communicate though is that when a woman is successful, she's there because she's a woman. She's not, she's there because she's excellent. But we have lots of hidden biases in the system that, that, that get to there. And so, for example, you know, if you read job adverts, the language that's used may be very male orientated. And so all of a sudden, women may not think that that advert speaking to them and they not, may not apply for the job. And so at that point, you've already failed. A quota at that point doesn't help. You need to go back and fix all the systems that feed into that. You have to go out and reach and find those excellent women and let them know that you're speaking to them. You should apply for this job. And, you know, this was something that I've worked very hard on building my research groups where I make sure that my job adverts that the language is, is tested there I mean the little computer programs now that you can run the text through and it will tell you whether you're using gendered words in either direction or other kinds of styles um, I think very carefully about the letters of reference that I write for both my my young male students and my female students and, and postdocs um, and then when you when you have that inclusive environment people apply once they apply, you can then, you know, you then don't, you don't have positive discrimination, that's illegal in the UK, but if you get the applications in, you are then selecting on excellence. And what I found in my group is I have 50-50 gender balance, not because I said I'm going to go out and positively discriminate towards women, but because I'm going to let the brilliant women in my field know that I'd like them to apply, and then they, they compete fairly against the men who apply, and there you get 50-50. So with the upcoming elections in the USA, we recently saw a number of journals such as Nature or the Scientific American for the first time to endorse one particular um, political candidate. Uh, what is your opinion about something like that? 
So I, th I think journals have always had editorial comment. I think there is, uh, it's important to distinguish between science, um, the politics of science and the commentary of, of editors. You know, editors write opinion pieces um, in magazines, as you say, like Nature, Science, Scientific American, a New Scientist. They will have policy pieces, they will write opinion pieces, and they're, they're free to do that. Um, we have free speech in, in our countries. Um, and they have those opinions that they can couch um, from the perspective of, of their journals. The scientific articles that are published in those journals themselves um, are apolitical. So science stands stands separately um, from our political systems. Our scientists are not elected and um, they don't go through election. They sit in a, in a separate system. And I think it's important to keep those separate. But I think it's also important to understand the benefits that science gives to our society. And it's important to educate our politicians so that they understand the importance and the benefit of science. And I think, you know, the COVID crisis has really highlighted that. Our politicians are desperate for solutions because they want to run their countries they want to have successful and thriving economies and they want to have healthy populations and of course they turn to science um, to, to help them to do that. There will be natural scientific debate as we are pushing the frontiers of knowledge but that should always be evidence-based and go back to the integrity of the research systems that, that we've been talking about. Um, politicians stand separate to that in the sense that they must make their case to the electorate and then the voters will decide um, and they the commentators that then step into that ring, be they the mainstream press, be that, you know, opinion writers or, or blog writers or those scientific commentators who work for those journals like the editors. And I think that they're free to express those opinions. So, Professor Mandel, you're not only a scientist, but you're also a communicator. So one of these scientists that can go out and become a bridge between science and the society. Uh, what uh, tips would you give to young scientists starting their career? Should they also go out and not only do their science, but should they also go out and talk about their science? So my experience, scientists are really excited about the work they do. Um, you know, it's it's a passion they have. They're driven to do it. It's almost a vocation. Um, and it's a real privilege to be able to, to do science and have, have the opportunities to do that. Not all people in all countries have that opportunity. And so what I've seen in my young scientists is they have a real um, drive to go and communicate that, 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 that subject that they, they love whether that's to, to children in schools, whether that's on the local media, whether that's at international level. And I think that you know, we, are, we have a, a real ecosystem within the UK of communicating science from individual scientists who may go into their local town on a Saturday and open up an experiment on a table and show shoppers as they're going by and attract young children and, and help them to do experiments there in the, the shopping mall, um, or whether it's right through to our big institutions like our Science Museum in London, um, international exhibits that Will, will travel around the world and portraying really uh, the frontiers of science in a way that's easily publicly accessible. And then also talking about big global challenges. So for example, antimicrobial resistance, which is another um, sleeping giant of global health crisis um, that is hitting the world quietly while we look in the other direction um, and, and deal with COVID. Um, but actually helping people to understand why it's important that we don't take drugs that we don't need, that we think about um, disease spread, that we think about all of these issues. It's how people live their lives and actually whether we're talking about the exotic nature of the universe and black holes and, and explosions at the edge of the distant universe when stars get to the end of their life or whether we're talking about food hygiene all of this has a scientific basis to it um, and I think certainly my experience has been that people are really keen to hear about it they're very keen to connect with scientists they want to hear about the work that we do and they want to know how that affects their lives but I think the important thing is that we don't use jargon that we don't don't use language that keeps people out, that we have an in-group environment. We have to try to be um, inclusive in our language. We have to explain clearly our concepts and also explain why what we do is important and the impact that it has beyond our field. And I think our young scientists are really talented at being able to do that. And certainly in the UK, we have lots of programs to help train um, our young scientists to communicate and professionals in public engagement who will come towards, you know, scientists and say, well, you know, even if you don't feel comfortable doing this, we can really help you because we're professionals at doing something quite innovative in the public engagement space. And that collaboration is also really important.
So it's important to mention that the UK is also uh, running one of the biggest, if not the biggest, science communication competitions in the world, and that is FameLab, uh, which is what got me first into communication science. And I think it's brilliant and has become worldwide and widespread. By yeah, now. Fame, FameLab is a fantastic initiative, you know, and thanks, thanks for mentioning it, because I've met brilliant young scientists and science communicators around the world um, who said to me, oh, I won FameLab. And you think, wow, you know, what, what a network. And then, of course, you have all of your FameLab friends and collaborators. You can share best practice. You can get tips from one another. And I think that's a really fantastic way also to address disinformation, because helping our scientists and actually bringing forward people who love to communicate science because not all scientists are genuinely comfortable in that space but bringing forward brilliant communicators like you to say well actually I can bridge that gap between science and society that also really helps us deal with disinformation. So Professor Mandel I would like to thank you for this inspirational and energizing talk uh, discussion and all the useful information and I wish you all the best in the future keep informing us and keep inspiring us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure and my privilege to talk to you today.